I worked in Mumbai, that time Bombay, where the development institution, development bank affiliated to World Bank. Uh, but there was always dream to go and work outside of India. Didn't get too many opportunities. And then uh, Mr. Bukhater, who was setting up a joint venture with the Indian business house, I met him through the general manager of Bank of Baroda, because I happened to know him, and said, you're looking for a finance manager for your new venture. So I have a young boy, and he may be interested. But uh, I had a lot of assistance from the family. However, uh, there was a little bit of attraction for money. So I came here with a commitment that I might try for a few months, and if I like, then I stay, otherwise I go back. So I took leave from my organization in India, came here for exactly three months, never went back. <laughs> Journey was interesting. Uh, I started working as a financial construction company, which was the joint venture company Mr. Bukhatri had set up. And uh, starting from buying cement and steel and whatnot for the company, I looked after uh, human resource, recruitment, and so on and so forth. Small company with 50 people the year I joined. And in six years, we had 5,000 people. And the group was growing. And at that point in time, in 78, Mr. Bukhatri was setting up a few hotel projects, Holiday Inn, Novotel, Marbella Club. So he wanted a project manager. With my background in development bank, he made me manager of that company. But I worked for three years and saw the projects through. I think I did a reasonable good job. So he transferred me to the parent company, and I became the CEO at the age of 29. So that was a good leap. Uh, bottom line is, at the end of the day, if you do honestly what you know and have eyes and ears open to learn what you don't know, then you grow better. In 1998, I happened to be in Jodhpur, which is my hometown. And I got a little inspiration that, having done so much, I've done nothing back for my hometown. And I thought, what to do? And uh, more I thought, more I thought, because I did not want to do anything which is religion-centric, community-centric, or for this particular lot of people. And education came in my mind. So uh, I set up my first school in Jodhpur in 98 which is not for profit, it is in memory of my late grandfather. Then I thought of bringing Indian good school to Dubai or UAE. I set up my first school in 2000 in Sharjah, Delhi private school. It was in collaboration with institution in India and that took off well. And then 2003 we set up DPS Dubai. Then had a break of almost 10 years. Then came Victory Heights. Southview. Now we have DPS in Russell Khema. We are right now in the next three years planning to do two more schools. Uh, we have acquired land for both. So one school we are going to hopefully break ground next month. Uh, went out for tenders last week. So that's one school. That's a British curriculum but primary school. Uh, but the land was small so we didn't want to do a, we can't do a large school of quality at that uh, place and that has been approved going ahead. The second land we have bought in Mudon, that's about 350,000 square feet as big as Southview. There we are debating to do a premium British school or we might add a new curriculum in our bouquet which we don't have today. So in next three years hopefully two more schools. The sheer fact the Indian population is the largest population in the country. Therefore, our enrollments in Indian school is much higher. For example, Sharjah school has 6,000 students. Dubai school has 4,000 students. By virtue of the number two, the tuition fee levels in Indian curriculum schools are relatively low. Therefore, we have to have large numbers. A lot of costs are same, particularly real estate, which is the biggest cost in setting up a school. Uh, so Indian schools generally tend to have much larger. The good part is a lot of young population is moving into UAE. And also Sheikh Mohammed has declared that his desire is to double the population of UAE or Dubai in the next five years. So I certainly think there's going to be massive demand, but demand for quality schools. 
whenever people ask me, is there room for more schools in UAE? I say there's room at the top. If your quality is good, there's plenty of scope. If quality is not good, the administrative body, namely KHDA, Lin Sharjah SPA, and Abu Dhabi EDEC, they don't take it kindly. So they want to see that you do provide quality education. And quality education at affordable cost. I mean, they don't want to see only premium schools. They want to see schools which fit into the budget of almost everyone. Uh, so uh, the numbers are good. And this year, registration-wise, has been the best year. The good thing is the UAE government, and particularly Dubai, is committed to making sure that the quality of education in UAE ranks among the top two or three in the world. So there's a lot of emphasis on quality investment. Challenges, the biggest challenge in the school are only two. Number one is real estate. That's the size of the investment. And number two is the teachers. Therefore, good schools make a lot of investment in professional development of teachers, but the challenge will remain. Uh, I don't know how to do it, but there must be a way to encourage more young people to take into this profession. But that's otherwise going to be a bigger challenge. Though distance learning, AI, whatnot, they all will help. But at the end of the day, soft skills can come only from the teacher's personal classroom interaction and so on and so forth. Like UAE has a good policy. Whenever there are massive development coming up, they ensure that master developer keeps few plots of land for schools. He just can't build and sell. So that ensures that uh, school land is made available. Teachers will remain a challenge. So schools will have to make more and more investment uh, to make sure that they uh, get uh, fully abreast and knowledgeable with the best practices that is necessary. If you owe it to children, you have to provide them the best. We have never acquired school. Brooklyn Melodies is a different uh, vertical altogether, which fits into our scheme of things. Because uh, that's not mainstream, but it is something, a huge support, uh, which you provide to all the schools. I mean, our schools have 14,000 students in UAE, and invariably uh, parents want their children to go and learn music, whether it's Western or Indian classical or whatever it is. So that was one of the reasons we found that this is something which fits into our scheme of things. We would not really think of buying schools. We like to create a school because then you create with your own mission, vision, ethos, culture. When you buy a school, it comes with its own culture, which may not, may or may not uh, blend with what we think and what we like to do. So our role, desire would be to create greenfield schools. No, no. At least, uh, I don't know how long will I live, but not the next 15, 20 years. What will my son will do after I'm gone? I'll leave it to him. But I won't, uh, today if somebody came to me and said, look, uh, we give you a big valuation and will you sell your equity? I would not. Because for me, it's not only passion. Uh, there's a lot of obsession, quality, interaction with, I mean, just now as we're coming up in the corridor, you saw one student called me by name. Now, that's priceless. Once I do IPO, I may not have that. I may not have people who walk in the corridors whom I know, they know me. I like to keep that contact. I like to keep the relationship. Education is never a business. It's something that you want to do or you don't want to do. Oh yes, uh, my son uh, is very much there and hopefully my daughter is going to move in from New York into UAE. So Brooklyn Melodies and that vertical she'll probably take care. And Amit, uh, uh, he'll take care of uh, whatever we have created and he has to grow. He has to grow because if you're not growing, then you're regressing. So as Sheikh Mohammed says, race to excellence never has a finishing line. So we have to keep running. There's never a mantra for success. 
as you walk your journey opportunities come your way you have an open mind and then you do things based on what you see and what works for you is the mantra what works for you may not work for me <coughs> well what works for me may not work for somebody else but one or two things which i especially lay emphasis on is man management if you have skills of man management that means you hold your team together and if you hold your team together then you succeed very few companies have failed because of marketing problem or finance problem they have invariably failed because they did not look after their people so one of the things that i do lay a lot of emphasis on is uh, man management personal interaction with uh, staff people like i try to do once a year i have dinner with most of them that binds us together walk your journey keep your mind open look around what comes your way and uh, move accordingly